Thanks, Praveen. Uh, so next I'll invite up my colleague, Dr. Mupiti. Um, he's going to tell us about some of the autonomic features that you've heard about, but more importantly, how we address those um, in sort of practical ways uh, to manage those symptoms. So while that's, um, can everybody hear me? Yeah. So while that's loading up, um, I want to thank the um, MSA team and Dr. Vernino for giving me an opportunity to talk today. And um, feel free to interrupt me whenever um, there's a question or there's a word that you don't understand. And um, you know, there is a lot of the times when you go to these kinds of meetings, um, it's presumed that we come here and talk and you listen, uh, but it's really not that way. Um, every time I see a patient, I learn something new. So if there is something that you think that's useful for the rest of the community that you think we as a physician should know, uh, then I think you should definitely chip in because I think we all continue to learn every time we see a new patient. Finally, I think looking at the schedule, I'm the one keeping you all from uh, having a break. So I'll try to uh, go fast. Um, so orthostatic hypertension, I think it was kind of brought up a couple of times in previous two talks. It means that there's a drop in blood pressure when you change from a supine position, I use the word supine, which means lying down, to either sitting or standing position. And for the sake of definition, we use, most of you know probably that blood pressure has two values. The top one is called the systolic, bottom one is called the diastolic blood pressure. And the way we define if somebody has orthostatic hypertension is that if there's a drop in the 20 mm uh, Hg in the top value or the 10 in the bottom value. And it can be neurogenic or non-neurogenic. So for example, um, if I don't get any water for a couple of days, uh, you take some blood out from me, uh, then I will have drop in blood pressure when I stand up. Now, that has nothing to do with your nervous system. You're just dehydrated. You don't have enough blood in your system. Um, neurogenic is where there's a neurological problem, which is actually causing that drop in the blood pressure when you stand up. And it can be diagnosed in the clinic, um, just a simple test where you lie down, you can get your blood pressure done, you stand up, and you get your blood pressure, and you look at the numbers, and if the numbers drop significantly, then you have orthostatic hypertension. Or you can come to our lab and we'll do lots of fancy testing and then still tell you the same thing. Um, it, can, it, pre it tends to be present in most patients uh, who have multiple system atrophy, not necessarily 100%. And it can be the initial symptom in quite a few of the patients, along with the urinary dysfunction that Steve Onino is going to talk after the break about. And um, as I said, can be diagnosed in clinic or in a lab. So one of the questions that comes up when I see patients, what happens when you stand up? Um, I just stood up. Every time you stand up, because of the gravity, there is going to be some pooling of the blood down to your feet. But most of us, throughout our life, whenever you stand up, you don't necessarily feel dizzy, lightheaded. You don't feel anything. You don't even think twice about standing up and getting up and going. Um, it's because while there is pulling of the blood uh, down to the leg, there'll be reflexes in your neck um, and in other blood vessels which compensate for that. And, and the reflex change brings out increased heart uh, blood output from your heart and also causes constriction of the blood vessels in your legs. And those things work together to compensate for it and prevent actual drop in the blood pressure. So, when we stand up, most of us don't actually have a drop in the blood pressure. Most of us don't have any symptoms. The problem comes when there is a neurological problem which is preventing the, those reflexes from um, kicking in. And the, one of the words that you, we use is called, the, um, let me go back here, is the um, reflex, just a fancy word for all those mechanisms where uh, the blood pressure is kept up uh, by um, when you stand up. Um, this picture might not project well enough for me to um, focus on it, but I'll just point out that you know this is your heart right here, and this is your blood vessels in your neck, and this is that um, little picture that Dr. Chitnis had shown you earlier, uh, where you have the pons and the medulla, and then this is your spinal cord. So whenever you stand up, there'll be pooling of the blood in your legs, and, and these reflexes in your neck and in your heart can send signals to your brain, 
and then um, either come back to your heart directly or go to your spine and go to various blood vessels and compensate for that pooling of blood in your legs. And if they all work smoothly, you never even know that there is a problem. Um, but if there is any problem in those tracks anywhere, uh, that's when you start noticing dizziness, light airiness, so on and so forth. And the battery reflex failure, it could be secondary, can cause orthostatic hypertension, so you have drop in the blood pressure. Um, the same reflexes also can make sure that when you're lying down, your blood pressure do doesn't go too high. And the same reflexes also said monitor your blood pressure um, when you're lying down versus when you're standing. And so in most of us, when you're sleeping at night, your blood pressure tends to be a little bit low on the lower side. It's called dipping. So if I were to put a blood pressure monitor on you know, any of us and, um, who are healthy, and, and you go home and we continue the blood pressure for 24 hours, at night there's going to be a slight dip in the blood pressure. And in folks who have any of these nervous system problems which are affecting the blood pressure, um, what we see is called a non-dipping. And it's very relevant to this whole management of orthostatic hypertension. I'll come to that in a second. Um, and then it can also cause supine high blood pressure. So when you're lying down, your blood pressure tends to go up, apart from the drop in the blood pressure when you stand up. They're all interconnected, and they all make the management a little bit tricky. So going to the symptoms, what do most people feel uh, from, from an orthostatic hypertension point of view? Um, so when you stand up, if your blood pressure were to drop, it affects the amount of blood that goes to your brain. And most of the symptoms that pe patients complain of are directly proportional to the amount of blood that goes to the brain or lack thereof. So either you could feel lightheaded on standing, that tends to be the most common symptom. Uh, they feel like they might um, lose consciousness or pre-syncope, or sometimes they actually might have a syncope a couple of times, and then it ends up being diagnosed uh, in a physician's office. Um, but there are some subtle symptoms which might be missed, and I think they're uh, quite relevant. Um, you could just feel tired whenever you stand up. You might just feel that you're not able to concentrate or think as fast as when you're standing up, walking around. Especially in this day and age, you know, everybody is walking on their phone, texting, whatever. You know, nobody is just walking anymore. And, and so we all do something else while walking. The culture is that you're wasting time by just not doing and walking, and uh, just walking without doing anything. So uh, you might see in future that there might be more people who just complain that they're not able to concentrate or do other things while they're walking, not necessarily feel lightheaded or fall. Sometimes patients might complain of uh, palpitations, some tremulousness, anxiety. Uh, they might even have some nausea. Um, another sort of uh, symptom that tends to be less recognized outside the autonomic community is the sense of dragging. Or it's almost like a coat hanger at the back of your neck. Something is pulling you down. You're almost like it's something at the back of my neck. You can just check. Um, that kind of sense of weightness feeling at the back of your neck is something that's commonly recognized as a feature of um, a drop in the blood pressure. And these symptoms tend to be worse in various uh, times and with various activities. They tend to be worse early morning, which can be a big problem because you tend to get out of the bed and you want to get on with your day's activities. Um, they can be worse after a large meal, and they tend to, tend to get worse within like 30 minutes after a meal, can last up to an hour or so. Um, they tend to be worse any time your cold body temperature goes up. You have fever, you're working outside in Texas. I know one patient who likes to do that. Um, or after prolonged standing um, for any reason. Uh, and in, with most activities, there will be pooling of blood to your muscles. And, and, and so consequently, because of lack of those reflexes that I talked about, there isn't enough blood going to your brain, and that also affects it. And so we, I just wanted to go through some of these uh, things as to why the symptoms might be worse in different um, times of the day. Um, so early morning, it tends to be worse because a lot of the times in MSA patients, there is going to be a high blood pressure when you're lying down. And that tends to um, lead to sort of more urination because of more urine being produced, more blood going to your kidney. And so early morning, there might be a slight um, hypovolemic state, your overall 
uh, fluid content might be on the lower side. And that makes the early morning symptoms even worse. And I, at a later point, I'll talk a little bit about how to compensate for some of these things with very simple techniques. Um, after meals, there'll be more pulling of blood to your gut, and, and that can be a symptom. So or if you, especially if you like large carbohydrate meats, you know, pizza and these kinds of things with this uh, big carbohydrate content in the meal, um, it can cause more blood circulation to your gut area, and you can feel more symptomatic. Um, again, hot weather will cause sort of vasodilation or blood vessel dilation in your skin. Um, so more blood going to your peripheral area and not as much going to your brain. And then with physical activity, there will be more blood supply to your muscles. And that, uh, again, not as much going to your brain. So how do we go about trying to manage it? Um, if you think about simply, oh, well, you know, your blood pressure is dropping when you stand up. Give me something to keep it up. Now, um, that it would be that easy if it had been the case that where I don't drink for a day or two, or you just took a lot of blood from me. Because then in that case, you just replace whatever volume that's lost, and then everything would be fine. But in various nervous system disorders where there is drop in the blood pressure, it's not actually the volume of the blood that's necessarily abnormal. It's those reflexes which control or which manage the change in the posture. And those are not necessarily as easy to manage. And there are a couple of things that um, really cause a big problem with management of orthostatic hypertension. The most important one is the supine hypertension. So supine is when you're lying flat. Hyper is high blood pressure. And, and so whenever you have, if you, if you had been to doctors before MSA or before similar diseases, um, the doctor will check you for a blood pressure. He's not actually checking for orthostatic hypertension. He's checking to see if you have high blood pressure called supine hypertension. Really high blood pressure gives you at a higher risk for strokes, heart attacks, kidney problems, eye damage. And if you, you know, smoke, if you um, have family history, if you have high cholesterol, you know, it increases the risk of all these manifestations. And this is where the problem comes in MSA regarding giving medication to prevent the drop in the blood pressure because any time you give a medication to prevent the drop in the blood pressure, you're going to increase the supine blood pressure. And, and they work on the same, the, the same side of the coin. You know, you cannot do one thing completely without sort of affecting the other one. And a lot of the times it's the balance between them. So we came up with some management principles as a guide and they have to be individually applied to the patient every time you see them. Um, first one is to improve as much as we can the orthostatic hypertension, the drop in the blood pressure, without raising your supine blood pressure, because we don't want your blood pressure to go really high and put you at risk for stroke, heart attack, various other um, long-term problems from having high blood pressure. Um, number two, improve your st uh, sort of standing time, so the amount of period of time that you can stand and do various activities before you feel dizzy, lightheaded, that you need to sort of sit or uh, lie down for a few minutes. And, and to relieve any other orthostatic symptoms. So if you feel dizzy, tired, you feel like you're going to sink, you know, you're going to uh, lose consciousness, uh, or if you're not able to perform any activities while you are standing. And the last thing, it kind of three and four are pretty much related, is improve your activities of daily living. Um, I mean, if you want to change your shirt, change your trouser, you know, get up and go to the backyard, those are simple things that we all take for granted. And none of us want to be falling every time you do such simple things at home. And, and so the idea is to control the blood pressure, at least the, those simple things where you won't need assistance from others to help you and you can manage by yourself. Um, and so one of the principles, and this could be controversial, and we can talk about in the Q&A session or now, um, is that if the patient is completely asymptomatic, let's say your blood pressure, if you remember earlier in the slide, I had talked about a drop in 20 in the top value and then 10 in the bottom value is called orthostatic hypertension. At present, let's say you go to the clinic and uh, you're getting evaluated for some other reason, and, and you have a drop in 30 or 35, but you say, I feel fine. 
I don't feel dizzy or lightheaded when I stand. I feel like I can walk around. I have not fallen. I haven't had a syncope. Um, you know, it would be difficult for me to convince you that, no, no, we need to treat you, especially if you have high blood pressure to begin with, especially if you're taking medication for high blood pressure. Um, then it becomes very tricky to convince that, oh, we need to treat this, uh, because anything I, we give you will increase your supine hypertension. Um, the key point is, though, is it's important to make sure that the patient is actually asymptomatic. Uh, I was talking earlier uh, with a colleague of mine. Um, are those patients who say, I don't have lightheadedness, are they asymptomatic? Are they, is there a subclinical sort of cognitive ability that is not being detected very well? Are they not able to do simple things when they stand up that they don't necessarily realize? as well, and we need to do a better job of sort of going through those uh, subtle questions that we might need to ask to get, a, get to the bottom of that. And then to avoid various drugs, which can uh, worsen your high blood, uh, the drop in the blood pressure or the orthostatic hypertension. So what kind of drugs can worsen the orthostatic hypertension? Um, if you take any uh, water tablets, uh, diuretics we call them, generally given for um, hypertension, uh, any other blood, low blood pressure lowering medication. Uh, a certain types of antidepressant medication can cause it. And then uh, as um, Dr. Chitnis and Dr. Kimani mentioned earlier, anytime um, you try levodopa or some of those cousins of that, that cinemat group of drugs can also cause a drop in the blood pressure. Something to keep in mind if you, know, if you were to be going on the medication or if you are on the medication. So in terms of management, you know, there are various non-pharmacological tricks that we can suggest, and they all help a little bit, and then there are various drugs. And I'll go through the non-pharmacological ones first, and then I'll go through various drugs that are available. Um, I personally believe that the non-pharmacological ones should be tried in, in uh, most patients, if possible, before we try the medication, or they could be tried simultaneously to, sort of, to develop some kind of synergy between various measures that we try. And the pharmacological ones um, include the uh, mydodrine that some of you might be on, Florinef, uh, pyridostigmine, and then uh, droxidopa. So the non-pharmacological things, um, there's a drop in the blood pressure when you stand up. One simple way non-pharmacologically you could deal with it is to increase the blood volume or increase the amount of fluid that's circulating in your blood vessels and your heart. And you could increase the amount of fluid that you take. Uh, most people would say, well, how much fluid I need to drink? Um, I would recommend at least that as a good uh, sort of uh, baseline number to look at, 1.5 to 2.5 .2 liters a day. Again, um, Texas summer, you might want to increase that a little bit. You know? So you got to look at it in terms of where you are and how, how, um, what kind of fluid requirements you might need as to the weather and the day type that you're dealing with. Warm weather, hot weather, you would need to increase it. Um, I, as, as a rough ballpark, um, if your urine is too dark, you know, perhaps you're a little bit on the dehydrated side of it. It's very easy. It wouldn't require any fancy testing to know if the urine is too dark or light enough. Um, other things, you can increase the amount of salt that you take. Now, um, there are, you can supplement diet, so increase the amount of salt in your diet. Um, but unless you have really loving family, you know, if you add salt in all the food, it might be difficult at home. Uh, so you might want to take extra salt just on your plate. That's one way to deal with it. But if you really are not the kind of person who likes much salt in your food, or doesn't want to mix salt in your food, um, is to take salt tablets. Um, they're available over the counter. Um, generally, I, I start recommending folks, you know, try that. I think they come in one gram tablets, and then you can try up to uh, one to two grams three times a day. A lot of the times, if you're not in this conference and if you're in a conference where they're talking about high blood pressure, they will kill me for saying take salt, <laughs> right? Um, so normally we never say take salt to anybody. But in, this is a special situation where you're trying to increase the fluid intake. 
uh, a salt intake to increase the amount of fluid that we have in our blood vessels, in our heart that's pumping around. Um, so the way you want to make sure that you're not taking too much, make sure that your supine blood pressure is not really going very high, um, is to uh, monitor your blood pressure. And then monitor your weight. If you're taking too much salt and you, you're retaining a lot of fluid, and if you keep gaining weight, you know, we need to assess, are you taking too much? Um, we can also do, again, some fancy testing. We can do a 24-hour urine sodium level before we, you start taking the tablet and after, and there's various numbers, and you can see based on those numbers if you're taking adequate amount of salt or not. I would recommend trying simple things, you know, checking your blood pressure, checking your weight, if your feet are getting really swollen. Those kinds of measures will give you a quick and dirty way of, to tell you if you're taking too much salt. Um, but sometimes we do this, especially if somebody feels like um, they're not sure if they're taking enough or if they can't take above a certain number of salt tablets because it's just very difficult to take them. Um, then we could check that to make sure you're getting adequate amount of salt. And other simpler measures, um, we routinely tell uh, patients to keep their head end of the bed up when they're sleeping, you know. And it's difficult to put two pillows and then sleep this way. So, um, you know, some, there are some patients of mine who put uh, bricks under the head end of the bed so the whole bed is a little bit up. Or during the day, if they're resting, you know, they, they try to rest in a um, couch where the head end is up, not necessarily flat. And so this prevents, well, it doesn't necessarily prevent the supine hypertension, but the, the blood that is going to your brain is not at the same pressure that you measure with your arm. So let's say you measure with your arm and your blood pressure is 180 over 110 when you're lying flat. When you're up a little bit, the arm measurement might still be the same, but because of the gravity, the pressure inside the brain would be a little bit lower. And we're trying to, one of the principles we talked about earlier, we're trying to prevent very high blood pressure exposure to your brain to prevent complications like strokes and other kinds of things. Um, it also prevents um, sort of excessive urination at night by having a head end up. Other thing we try to do is the um, stockings for your legs. We talked about how when you stand up, there's pooling of the blood down to your legs. Uh, some of that happens because the blood vessels are not contracting enough to pump the blood back to your heart. So these very tight, either custom fit or non-custom fit stockings to your legs could help them go up. Um, the catch is that you ought to, be, you ought to wear them when you're, when you're just about to get out of the bed. First thing you wake up in the morning, you need to wear them before you get out of the bed. You can't say, I'll get out of the bed, go and brush, watch some TV, have some breakfast. Then I wear them. It's not as helpful because you've already done a lot of the activities standing and walking. And that I tend to find is, is one of the you know, issues. Uh, you can also try an abdominal binder, you know, which, again, um, will increase the amount of blood that goes back to your heart, uh, but again has a similar limitation in terms of uh, placing it well ahead of time before you get out of the bed. Other quick fixes, in the middle of the day you're doing something and you just feel like, oh, I just feel this little lightheadedness and I wish I can just do something. You can try just some plain water. And this has been proven, this is not some quackery. Um, uh, you could try up to 250 ml of glass, two glasses of water and that will pump up your blood pressure by about 10 to 20 mmHg for one to two hours. Um, and then there are various uh, physical counter maneuvers, and some of these um, might be easy, might not be easy, and you have to sort of look at your own physical ability within the limitations of what Dr. Kimani and Dr. Chitney's talked about, various motor and non-motor manifestations of MSA. Uh, and so these are the simple techniques, and all of them give you a quick um, jump in your blood pressure. And if you're feeling really sort of feel like you might, you're standing, walking, and suddenly you feel like you might uh, feel dizzy, you might syncopize, or you might fall down because of low blood pressure, you could try any of these to see if they would help you. Uh, simple things like toe, toe rise or leg cross will sort of increase the amount of blood that goes back to your heart by pumping the uh, muscles. Uh, you can also sort of lean forward, um, step up on a little stool if it's possible. 
Um, and then there's this little called genuflection, the fancy word, but just going on a deep, deep knee bend, and then and, and a squat. And now I realize later in the disease of MSA, this level of mobility might not be possible in everybody, you know. Uh, and but earlier in the process, and if you're a mobile person, and if you feel like you could do some of these things, it might be worth trying. And, and I'll go into the medication side of it. Uh, this is the first one. Um, is called Mydodrin. It's a um, direct alpha uh, one adrenal receptor. It's an agonist, so it makes those. Um, those um, blood vessels contract peripherally. And most patients respond to at least 10 milligrams of it. You can start at 5 milligrams, but you can go up to 10 milligrams. The onset starts in 30 to 60 minutes, and, and the effect lasts 2 to 4 hours. And those two points are critically important because um, we try to load this medication. We try to ask you to take this medication. We use the word front loading, as in ask you to take the medication pretty much early morning, before lunch, and mid-afternoon. Um, the reason is that after you take the medication, if you were to lie flat, you're exposing yourself to a significant amount of high blood pressure. And, and the medication, as I said, lasts for two to four hours. So we, don't want, we want you to take early enough that, that you take it at least four to six hours before you go to bed. And so if you go to bed at 10, you should, probably should not be taking it before, you know, not, not probably not after 6 for sure, but I would encourage you to take it even earlier, maybe 3 or 4 at best. Because um, another important thing is that when you take it during the day, you cannot lie flat. You know, you might have to sort of use a couch if you need to take a nap, but you really should not be lying flat. Um, and so I mentioned that sort of not to lie f um, flat asleep in the afternoons. It's not so much about um, night and day, it's much more about when the drug is acting that you don't want to be lying flat. That's the, that's the bottom line. So uh, if something happens and you really need to lie flat, I mean, I would ask you to even skip it. So that's, that's something that you can play with. Um, the major limitation, as I said, is that the supine blood pressure, that's something uh, we ask you to monitor regularly. Um, scalp tingling, some goosebumps, are other manifestations, but I've never had anybody who said he can't take it for those purposes. Other medication is called uh, Florina for fludrocortisone. Um, this is actually a steroid medication, but not the kind that you know baseball players took or used to take or take now. Uh, but it's a different kind which just increases the amount of fluid that, um, that you have in your blood circulation. And, and it also has some activity on the alpha receptors, but a lot more on the fluid retention part of it. Um, and generally, it comes in 0.1 milligrams tablets. Um, you can take half of it, but you can take 0.1 to um, 0.2 a day in the mornings. You can go all the way up to four tablets if you need to. Um, again, you need to watch for the supine high blood pressure. Um, you need to watch for a low potassium level, which, which is difficult to know. We wouldn't know if you have a low potassium level. So that's something that needs to be monitored. Because if the potassium level goes really low, that can be dangerous. And then uh, other way to know if you're getting too much fluid retention um, is if your feet are getting swollen up. Um, that would kind of give you an idea that maybe there is quite a bit of fluid retention. Um, this medication. Uh, it's called pyridostigmine. Um, it's routinely used in a different disease called myasthenia gravis. Um, but it has been proven um, to be helpful in patients who have orthostatic hypotension. Um, it's, it's what we call a cholinesterase uh, inhibitor. And effectively, what it does is that it increases the amount of chemical called acetylcholine being available at the synapses between various nerves. So uh, it's almost like the traffic through the nerves is slightly increased by this medication. And generally, we start at 30 milligrams two to three times a day, and then you can increase up to 60 milligrams three times a day. Uh, based on the effect, there is a longer acting one. There's a 24-hour uh, time span version of it, which is a 180 milligram tablet. So you could easily supplement. Uh, once you get up to 60, three times a day, you can go to that other medication. One. Um, 
and it's generally tend to add it, it's, it works better if you add it a little bit of mitre rain, at least in a study that's been proven that where it works better. Um, it can cause a little bit of abdominal pain and diarrhea. We use it routinely in myasthenia gravis under the nerve muscle disease, and most people tolerate it quite well. And, and 63 times a day is kind of a medium level dose, so most people tolerate that well. And um, the cool thing about this medication is because, because it works at the synapses and it improves the traffic, um, we believe, and I think in the study it's proven, that this does not cause as much supine blood pressure, unlike the other two drugs I talked about. Um, but the effect on the drop in the blood pressure is less than the other two drugs. So that's, the, that's where the balance needs to be, uh, sort of need to manage on an individual patient basis. Um, but supine hypertension, the, the high, high blood pressure when you're lying down, is not a major problem with this, because the transmission only happens when you need it, and when you, you will need it when you're standing, not so much when you're lying down. So there is not much, as much of a supine blood pressure. Um, other medication uh, sort of in the pipeline is called droxydopa. It's been presently evaluated in various neurogenic orthostatic hypertension, so neurological causes a drop in the blood pressure. Uh, and it increases your adrenergic activity. And potentially, uh, I, I don't know the, all of the data, um, but there is some uh, suggestion that it might not cause as much supine hypertension as the first two drugs I talked about. And if that pans out, that would be of a, a dramatic significance, and there might be a paradigm change in how we go about various medication options, if that really does pan out. Um, the study results are pending, and the drug is right now not available, uh, as, far as, I, as far as I realize, right, um, outside the study. But it could be a potentially great drug uh, for treating the drop in the blood pressure and then the preventing the increase in the supine blood pressure. Uh, and we'll see, we should know, I think, early next year, mid next year. And so there are some specific scenarios that I mentioned earlier. An early morning drop in the blood pressure. Now, you know, we routinely encourage to have, uh, patients to have some uh, glass of water right by their side so they can have a quick gulp before they get out of the bed. And get out of the bed, you know, slowly in gradual stages. And, and make sure that your head end of the bed is elevated when you're sleeping. Um, other problem that happens is after meals, the drop in the blood pressure after eating a heavy meal. Um, so small, frequent meals, and, and meals which don't have as much of a carbohydrate, because those are the ones which lead to a lot of the pooling of the blood in your um, abdominal area. Hard drinks or food, hot food might worsen symptoms, so that's something to keep in mind. Now, um, nighttime supine blood pressure, which is when you're lying flat, the blood pressure going up. So as I said, no mitre drain after you know, four or five based on when you go to bed. Um, and this would be one good recommendation. I have um, a wine glass, maybe two and more. Um, a hard drink, hard drink, <laughs> hard drink might prevent the significant um, rise in the blood pressure. And I, I agree, presumably you don't want to drink too much and go to your bed, it might, might actually cause some drops. So maybe in bed watch TV or something might be better. Uh, and then make sure your head end, up is, um, head end of the bed is up. Um, I'll briefly mention this because it, it is one of the autonomic features, um, but we very rarely, almost never see a patient with MSA coming to our clinic saying, I don't sweat as much. Most people say, well, that's not a bad thing, you know, I'm okay. Um, but sweating ca function can be impaired in patients who have uh, multiple systems atrophy. And this leads to heat intolerance. That's the crux of the issue. Because we all sweat for a purpose. We all sweat to decrease our body temperature. So if you don't sweat as much, your body temperature goes up. And then if you remember earlier in the slide, anytime your body temperature goes up, the drop in the blood pressure, the orthostatic hypertension becomes worse. And so that tends to be the important uh, issue there. And so we can, um, again, do uh, testing to sort of document if the, the, the sweating is really decreased or not. But um, 
And the key issue, as I just mentioned earlier, is to make sure um, that you recognize if you have a decreased sweating, that, that you have to figure out a way to keep your core body temperature down, avoid really hot weather, so working out in hot weather. And to me, a lot of it is patient education. Patient education in terms of the medication as well as the um, non-pharmacological measures. Um, because there is no one single medication which doesn't have a side effect of high blood pressure. Uh, there might be some questions later, so I'll try to preempt one of them. Um, some of you might be thinking, well, how much is high? You know, how much should it be before I start calling my doctor or start panicking? And it, it depends upon individual patient. Now, if you don't have any other risk factors, there are some physicians who believe you can go all the way up to 160, 170, even 180, the top number, and go at the bottom number even 100, 110 when you're lying down. Now, that might be reasonable if you are a 45 or 50 year old, you don't smoke, uh, you don't have high cholesterol, you eat healthy and you've been an active person. Um, there is no family history of any problems with your heart or your brain. But if you're 70 year old and you smoke, you have high cholesterol, you have diabetes, that blood pressure might not be reasonable for you. So it, it needs to be titrated to your individual risk factors rather than throwing one number on the wall and everybody follows that number. Because I don't think that is the right way to do it. I would encourage everybody to keep a blood pressure calendar. Uh, all the patients that we see, we ask them to keep a blood pressure calendar. Um, one of my patients sends me regular messages with the blood pressure numbers, which, which is great, even between the visits. So I have an idea of where things are. I can tell her, uh, you know, how.